David, who's the charge of the of the Australian Embassy um, in Beijing. I'm now very happy to introduce you to everyone. Justin Hayter, he is an Australian Embassy in Beijing. Thank you very much. Just quickly, on behalf of the Australian government, we in Australia are very proud of Dr. John Yoo. He has a lifetime of distinguished service to his country and a lifetime of achievement in the field of public health. He's made a great difference to our own country, but also to our ability as a nation to build ties with the countries of Asia, including China. He typifies what I like to think of as our strengths, the ability to attract people from anywhere around the world, to allow migrants to follow their dreams, to exploit their talents and to achieve success, and then to very ably represent their country on the international stage. Of course, Australia and China are increasingly close partners. Our relationship is strong, being reinforced all the time at the political level. There's a lot of trade and investment, and there's a lot of close interaction between the people of our two communities and between institutions like the George Institute. Uh, essentially, for us, events such as this provide the glue that binds us more closely together. We're partners not just in our own interests, but so we can make a greater contribution to the wider region. That's essentially what Dr. John Yu typifies. We're very pleased to be associated with this event uh, and the activities of the George Institute, its Chinese partners, are things that we and other governments around the region should continue to support because global health, obviously, is something that's important to each and every country. Thank you very much. Please enjoy uh, this event.
to his role at the George Institute, but in part because John's vision and lifelong commitment to supporting relationships between Australia and Asia and to improving the health of people worldwide epitomises what the George Institute is all about. So it is for that reason that we established the John New Iteration. Now, relationships in Asia, but improving the health of people worldwide really also epitomises Josette. And the reason why we thought Josette was a highly suitable awardee for this year's John New Iteration. Arguably, Josette has probably done more to improve the health and the lives of millions of people, um, as is the mission of the George Institute. So, through her work at the UN Food Programme, um, she really helped move so many people out of years of poverty, malnutrition, and had an enormous impact. For us, it's fantastic to see you in this new role with, as president of the Asia Society, because clearly in that role you see improving relationships, engaging the world community, not only the US, but the broader community, including Australia, in a greater relationship with Asia and a greater relationship with China is what you're all about. So as I say, you epitomise um, what we believe the John New Iteration is all about. And for that reason, I would like to welcome you to the podium to receive the John New Medal. And then the price you have to pay for receiving the medal, of course, is to get the John New Iteration. Josette, welcome on behalf of the George Institute and our friends and colleagues in the room.
I also like your can-do approach, which I've come to associate with Australia all over the world with its great humanitarian work. And I would say at the World Food Program, there was no better friend in Australia to on the front lines of world hunger. It's a great humanitarian nation. When Professor Yu was born here in China in the city of Nanjing, he and his peers in China could have expected to live an average of 25 35 years. You outlived all those expectancies, Professor Yu. <laughs> Babies born in China today can expect to live to 76 years. A baby born in Shanghai today can expect to live to 83 years. That's comparable to a child born in Switzerland. There are many metrics that we can use to measure the transformation that has come to China in the past century. Life expectancy is certainly as staggering as any of those. This is a new chapter for China, one of seizing its destiny with conviction and optimism. Many in this room have not only been witnesses to that, but partners. At the Asia Society, we come from the Rockefeller family, and it's our 60th anniversary next year, and I've done a little research into when was the first Rockefeller intervention or partnership with China and found out that the original John D. Rockefeller, who was born a very poor man, when he was 24 years old and still a very poor man, decided to give half his monthly salary of $20, about $20, to China to help malnourished children, 1864. So this began over a century of true commitment of the Rockefeller family to partnering with the people of China in some extraordinary projects, such as founding the China Medical Board to support and train doctors and nurses. Um, and I would just say that at that time in 1914, there were only 5,000 doctors for a population of 442 million in China. John D. Rockefeller III, and I will, uh, and this is uh, one of the first anatomy classes um, early on. John D. Rockefeller III, who founded Asia Society, came to his beloved Asia after World War II and was devastated to see the effects of war. But he came back critical of the American approach. And he said, sometimes Americans go abroad and they want to send a shiny new Cadillac and say, here's your future. And he, he said, instead, we should approach the world as master mechanics who have something to offer to a different kind of master mechanic somewhere in the world and say, we'd love to come partner and help you build your dreams, what are they? And that is our DNA, and it has been how we organize and why I felt it was so important to work with Asia Society and to help really recognize Asia's emergence and the talent and brilliance of Asia. In fact, when I was growing up, I would say my first awareness of hunger was being told every night at dinner to finish all the food on my plate to help starving children in China. Even then, I wondered how that worked, how I ate everything on my plate and helped China. But it began kind of a lifelong intrigue on how we really tackle this issue of hunger. China's Great Famine so rocked the world not only because of its sheer scale, but also because so many in the world had known horrifying threat and realities of hunger in their own lifetimes or their ancestors' lifetime. And in fact, my ancestors fled a succession of famines that left the Irish population decimated and after World War I and World War II, whole nations were left without adequate food, giving birth actually to the first cross-border humanitarian work. Indeed, hunger and disease have plagued humanity and in many ways have driven human progress. For me, my awakening on this issue really came in 1987 during the Ethiopia famine. And I remember holding my first child in my arms. Uh, she was uh, just newly born. 
and seeing a picture of a mother holding her baby in Ethiopia. The baby was crying, but the mother had no milk and no ability to meet that cry. And yes, I felt compassion, and yes, I felt sadness, but I also felt conviction because it struck me the insanity of what I was seeing. Because actually solving hunger and many of the health challenges we have in the world do not require medical breakthroughs or rocket science. We know how to solve hunger. And it connects to virtually every non-communicable and communicable disease known to humanity. And so I remember at that time thinking, this is really what my life will be about, making a difference on this issue. I want to ask you all a simple question. How many of you in this room have known hunger in your own lifetime? Could you raise your hand? How about your parents' lifetime? How about your grandparents' lifetime? Thank you. What strikes me as I go around the world is that hunger is, has been a universal experience. Sometimes in health we want to judge. This nation or that nation is so backward. But as we can see in this room today, we have no right to judge. It's only in the past few generations that any nation has had the hope of truly moving the dial on human vulnerability. I was to learn about humanity's powerful connection to hunger when I served as head of the United Nations World Food Program, reaching about 100 million people a year on the front lines of hunger. It's the world's largest humanitarian agency, as Robin mentioned. And during the 2008 food crisis, food prices accelerated in the world faster than at any time in recorded history, doubling in six months, throwing 140 million people into abject hunger virtually overnight. This was actually a quote from me. I called it a silent tsunami. It was the first globalized humanitarian crisis in the world. And many of us asked, how could it be that prices would double not only in New York and Beijing and in Italy and in Australia, but also in the villages around the world that seemingly were disconnected from global food markets. In my journey to discover what had caused this really devastating escalation of vulnerability in the world, I went to the market in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And there, everything's carried by donkey, and there's no electricity, and there's all these kind of huts where food is sold from. And I went to one young man, and I said, your price of food is doubled. He said, yes. I said, how do you establish your prices? He said, it's very easy. I go on the internet every morning. I go to the Chicago Board of Trade. I see what their prices are, but we're a poor nation, so I just counted 10%, and I set my prices. And I remember looking around thinking, that I don't see a plug. I don't see a light bulb. But here we are in our globalized world where even these crises and the opportunity of technology are so in front of us. During that time, I carried this red cup, and you'll see it here. And this happens to be what WP uses to give children a cup of porridge. It costs about 10 cents a day around the world. And at the time, Wolf Blitzer from CNN said, Josette, World hunger is too big, we can't do anything about it. And I just instinctively pulled this cup out, which I had for my own inspiration. I said, it's really not. It's one cup, it changes a child's life completely. And it costs about 10 cents a day. And if you sprinkle a little micronutrients in there, you're saving the brain as well as the body. And what I found, the response to this cup was so phenomenal. The agriculture minister in Japan had tears running down his face when he saw it because he said this cup had saved his life after World War II. The development minister of Spain got very emotional at a hearing of the European Parliament saying this cup had saved his life during World War II. One of the leaders in South Africa said as a child she would attach this to her belt and it was the only sure thing she had in her life was a cup of food. And I realized, in fact, we are bound together. What we learned recently, thanks to groundbreaking work by The Lancet, 
is it's not just obvious <coughs> hunger, it's also a hidden hunger. And this is done by um, uh, a university in Chile that really has done brain scans to look and compare at children who receive adequate nutrition and proper health versus those who are malnourished. And the actual size of the brain can be different. And also the synapses and neurons in the brain don't develop. But what we learned, and I call it the burden of knowledge, <laughs> is that if this happens between conception and two years old, the brain can never be fixed. This isn't something that can grow later. And we didn't know that. There was always this attitude, it's maybe when the kid's older, they'll be out of the war zone, or they'll be out of poverty, and then the brain can grow. And we learned that that's not true. But we also learned amazing things about the cost of this to societies, to GDP, and to humanity. And if you look at the cost-benefit analysis, dealing with this issue is one of the most effective things that can happen. At WFP, we were desperate to find solutions. I don't know if UNICEF's here. They did amazing work with Plumpy Nut and other things. But we created this food called Wawa Mom. It's made with chickpeas, dried milk, a little bit of oil, and all the micronutrients needed to protect a child's brain. It doesn't require refrigeration or water. You can drop it into war zone, as we did in Somalia and Myanmar and other places. Tear a corner off and squeeze this in a kid's mouth, and it will literally bring them back to life. It will protect their, their brain and body, and it costs 17 cents to do that for a day. And so these new tools really make this a problem that can be solved. I just want to talk a little bit that to remind us of the scale of the challenge that we have in the next 40 years. We have to grow more food than the last 8,000 years combined. And I just say this because there's a certain mega trends that we really have to take into account as we look at the health challenges, including urbanization, including the demographics of aging, and including the fact that many young people today do not see farming as their future. And I want to thank Australia for being a great agricultural nation. But uh, in fact, you know, this is where China has done so much work to transform, really with one of the biggest challenges. They have 7% of the arable land in the world and 20% of the world's population, and yet need to tackle this. I just want to note that, you know, China, it's so exciting to see the brilliance of China emerging, including this year, China's first scientist ever to win a Nobel Prize in the sciences. A woman named Tu Yo Yo has won for her work in malaria treatment, and that work has saved thousands of lives throughout Asia and Africa, and I think we will be seeing more and more from the scientists of China and Asia. When it comes to eliminating hunger and abject poverty, China's taken a long and arduous path during the last century, but its greatest achievements have come with a speed really unseen in history. Since the 1970s, China has lifted 600 million people out of poverty. That's enormous. 600 million people, one-tenth of humanity. And in fact, China has lifted more people in the last 30 years out of poverty than all of human history combined. These outcomes are not predetermined. It takes political will. It takes required fundamental reform not only of economic systems, but of policy systems within government. It takes openness and partnerships and trade and investment. And all of those things also require the technical capacity and the building of an innovative society. China's achievements have been guided, have really been a global game changer. China's ability to feed itself not only has helped the world, meet the UN Millennium Development Goals ahead of their time, but reduce global food insecurity. And I will say in 2008, during the food crisis, there was not enough food trading in the world to feed, meet the demands and needs of nations. We literally faced the possibility that whole nations would not be able to obtain enough food. And if China hadn't been able to take care of its own population, we would have really been in a global catastrophe. And yet it did, and that um, 
and we see that over and over again. China also used to be the World Food Program's biggest recipient of food aid. But that changed, and in 2005, WFP stopped giving food to China and helping China, and China became a donor of international food aid and has been a significant partner since then. And I just want to uh, recognize, I don't know if any of you know this person, or recognize him. His name is Yuan Longping. He devoted his life's work to agricultural advancement, and he did so for a very personal reason, the effect uh, of what he saw during the starvation in the 1960s in China. And he's advanced a field of hybrid rice uh, for the past half a century in Anhui province. And I will just say that last week they announced that they had broken all records here in China in the production. So they'd set a new national record. And this kind of, these kind of leaders are really my heroes. During my time at the World Food Program, I was in Rwanda, and there was a, a woman farmer in a remote mountain terracing area. And from the folds of her dress, she pulled out a piece of paper, and she said, can you help me meet these people? And she opened up a picture, and it was a picture of terraced agriculture in Anhui province in China with some farmers there. And she had tears in her eyes. She said, look how lush this is. Look how much they're producing. I need to know them. I need to learn from them. And I thought this is really a new era where we'll see the developing world really reaching out and helping each other to solve these problems. Indeed, China, like so many nations, is tackling its vulnerabilities. But as we celebrate these successes, we also must acknowledge that a new set of health and wellness challenges, including shifting rapidly from the challenges of undernutrition to overnutrition, with obesity on the rise and fueling every category of non-communicable disease. China's population is growing older as it grows more prosperous. In relatively urbanized areas of China, more than 80% of deaths are caused by chronic conditions at a ratio that's on par with developed economies. According to the Chinese Ministry of Health, when residents suffer from hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases at a much higher rate compared to their rural peers, and when individuals are diagnosed, the rates for these illness they lead far more frequently to death in China than in, in more developed nations. China's losing pace on this front with other developing nations where ec the economic burden on China is one of the highest in the world. These are complex challenges that require new ways of working, breaking the traditional silos in scientific research and development, in health processes and health delivery, and in moving from models of disease management to wellness promotion. These challenges, this challenges government, businesses, science, and civil society stakeholders to work together more collaboratively. We cannot underestimate the barriers to doing that. These are very different tribes of experts and leaders with their own language, their own code words, and sometimes with deep suspicions of the other. <coughs> How do we get all hands on the wheel? How do we develop complementary strategies, short-term strategies to treat acute illnesses, and long-term strategies to change the policies of government, the environment, culture, and the behaviors in the workplace and of individuals, families, and communities? The answers for our future successes here in China and beyond will come not from solely from within the traditional boundaries of health and medicine, but with, with breaking those disciplinary silos. We must involve stakeholders across all sectors, including the media and um, education. We will be surprised that some solutions which have eluded us may be extremely cost-effective. And I have learned the secret key is to be sure to bring in the wisdom of women. I just want to show you quickly two inspiring stories from the front lines of my work on hunger. So in northern Cameroon, there have been cycles of 
of uh, malnutrition and hunger for decades, with food aid going in there constantly. And when I came to WFP, we looked at where we could lead. How do we get out of chronic support for hunger? And we found out in Cameroon, the, the challenge was there were no warehouses. So when harvests come, people eat well, the food's gone, they have to sell, there's nowhere to store it. And then the rains come and there's nothing to eat, we get a cycle of hunger and malnutrition. So we decided to offer, instead of food aid, building a warehouse. And everybody said it won't work, we don't trust anyone, we're not putting our food in a food bank, a shared space. And just when we were about to give up, we got the women of the village together and said, any ideas? They said, oh, well, that's easy. Put three key holes in the door, elect three villagers to have the keys, and no one can open the door unless three people are present. And so this three key solution <laughs> has spread to villages around, and it worked very, very well. And this was a very simple thing, but something that I would say, maybe academics sitting many thousands of miles away would not have thought of. I will just say these warehouses now are really the way of life, not hunger, the, as I call them, the boom and bust cycles of hunger and malnutrition. The second thing I want to say is listen to our young people. A young man came to me from the University of Guelph in Canada, and he said, I just had to meet you. I'm you know, 21 years old, I think it was at the time. And he said, I'm, I'm going to end um, uh, iron deficit around the world, he said, I, I, I have to do this. And I said, oh, you know, really, how are you going to do that? And he said, well, I figured out that in advanced societies when we used to have iron pans, we didn't have this epidemic of iron deficiency. And so I created this hockey puck that's iron that you put in a rice pot, and it puts iron into the food at exactly the rate. It costs about $5 in the last five years, which would be a revolution in treating this. And um, he took his invention to Cambodia and it was soundly rejected, even though it works very easily. And he realized um, he had to learn more about the people of Cambodia. And so he spent almost a year there studying the culture and he decided to come up with this lucky iron fish, because a fish is good luck. And this fish has a little smile, and when you put it in a rice pot, when the smile disappears, you need to get another lucky iron fish. And this is now in 66 countries. This is uh, part of the Hilton chain. They allow, in, when you check out of many of their hotels, for you to buy one for a family. But this is a kid, who, and I think he's now 23 years old, who just decided to take this on. And I will say, we're seeing more and more young people say, wait a minute, there must be a solution to this. I'm not going to wait, and I'm going to break the rules, and I'm going to take this on. And so I, I welcome them to my office all the time, and I'm always waiting to be surprised with the solutions they have. I think the fundamental thing, though, is we have to shift our discussion in health as a cost to governments, to societies, to families and individuals, to an investment with a powerful return on investment. Hunger, stunting, disease, cost societies, not only in terms of their competitive advantage in the world, but also in pure GDP. We need to move the hearts and minds of presidents, prime ministers, and finance ministers as much as the health ministers. We need to find champions and pace setters in provincial governors and the mayors of large cities where much innovation can take hold. Unhealthy populations are very expensive. And the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard, uh, the Chan family is the global chair of Asia Society. We're very uh, proud of their contribution to the School of Public Health there. And with the World Economic Forum, have estimated that globally $47 trillion of cumulative output will be lost between 2012 and 2030 because of the impact of NCDs and mental disorders. And I will just say, in 1993, the World Bank's World Development Report produced the first milestone report focused on return of investment. It was called Investing in Health, and that really set the pace, but we need that work to be continued to be developed uh, throughout the world. 
Columbia University estimates that China could generate 90% return on investment by implementing air and water protection me mechanisms to reduce the effects of pollution. And these require multi-stakeholder partnerships. We are looking for the trailblazers, not only in government, not only in non-for-profits, and the work of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Rockefeller George Institute, but also among the UN agencies and also among the innovators and scientists. With the power of connectedness on the internet, we can imagine helping create a sea change in how governments and societies view health investments. Indeed, technology can be a game changer, and I just want to point out the George Institute has a great uh, study they just put out called Mobile and Health, a uh, work here in China that uh, they've worked with Qualcomm and others to really put this out, and I think it's an excellent, inspiring report on the potential here. As we stand here today in Beijing, the elusive goal of a world devoid of abject poverty, child stunting, and hunger seems more achievable than perhaps at any time in human history. In fact, the world coming together has set bold and visionary goals together, just ratified less than two months ago in the United Nations in New York. That was China, that was the United States, that was Russia, that was Australia, that was Europe, that was Africa, that was Latin America, that was all of the Middle East, all of Asia standing together and saying no more. Not less, but no more. Eradicating hunger, eradicating extreme poverty, by 2030. These are bold and audacious goals. Some would say a pipe dream. This indeed is our common human challenge. And no one race, no one nation, no one faith can have a prayer of tackling it alone. Indeed, we are all in this together. We could be standing in no more exciting place for this vision of a world without poverty, without hunger, than here in China. And I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, could you join me in thanking Josette again? I think um, it's so rare that we get access to and we get to listen to somebody with the breadth and the depth together of experience and passion that you have and we're very, very fortunate. Thank you for coming all this way to talk to us. Thank you. Okay, so from that global perspective, um, what we'd like to do now in the remaining time is to bring it back to China um, and talk about some of the specific issues that we have here. Um, in China, and I, I was struck by one of the things that you said in your speech about how, what, 60 years ago, 55 years ago, there was the Great Famine of China. So estimates were 15 to 30 million, it's more than the population of Australia, lost their lives in that. And yet now, there is a problem with obesity, um, uh, primarily amongst children uh, here in China. Let's just use that to set a scene as to what are some of the healthcare challenges and opportunities um, and things that we need to do uh, here in China. Can I invite the other panelists to come up uh, quickly now? Let me just quickly introduce, um, this is Stephen McMahon. Stephen is the other uh, founder and principal director of the, uh, of the, George, Inst of the George Institute. Stephen Wong. And also Nini Wong. Nini is the uh, founder and CEO of Pine Tree Healthcare. Um, which is an example of the sort of powerful Chinese innovation um, and entrepreneurship that, uh, that, that we see in, uh, in China nowadays. Uh, Nenny, amongst a whole lot of other things, um, um, Nenny's company um, delivers innovative, innovative ways um, to provide home-based uh, care for aging populations, including the use of technology and robotics. But I'll let you talk. Okay, so we've heard from Josette. Um, 
why don't we start with um, with Stephen and Nenny? Um, and maybe we could start with you just quickly giving us top three top three healthcare challenges um, in China. Maybe we start with you, Stephen. I think for that question, number one is dealing with the, the epidemic of chronic diseases that affect a rapidly aging population uh, with an age structure uh, that is going to make the long term uh, management of chronic disease very difficult. And that, as Josette said, in, in the more developed parts of China, uh, life expectancy is very long. Uh, and it, whilst that's a good thing, it means that people live longer. Diseases. So that is a major issue and it's one that the, uh, the Chinese government is well aware of. I should just add that there's a long way to go. Um, in most of China, if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, and you're at very high risk of dying or having another one, most people get no treatment at all. So we're really starting from a pretty low baseline here. Um, so the second issue I think is that there are still major um, unresolved diseases of poverty. Tuberculosis is still common in this country, not obviously in this part of the country, but in, but in many others. Uh, and I think that this is something that should be uh, curable. It should be uh, not part of health in, in China anymore. This is a wealthy country. It doesn't need to have tuberculosis. And I think the third issue is that if China is going to deal with these problems and also deal with a, an enormous population Need an entirely new model of healthcare. The model of healthcare that it has today, which is focused on large tertiary care hospitals where most of the money goes, and then secondarily to district level hospitals, just isn't fit for purpose anymore. Uh, there aren't enough doctors, there aren't enough facilities, and we need something new. And we need Chinese entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism uh, to figure out new ways. Thanks, David. What about you? Uh, I, I would agree uh, that the first challenge is uh, the change of uh, our demo demographics and uh, the need to provide health care to people who are aging and have uh, more chronic diseases. And in that, I think uh, definitely innovative care, care models should be uh, allowed to uh, foster and uh, develop. Uh, and second thing is uh, continuity of care. We actually look at uh, our aging population and how their healthcare resources are all disconnected. And when they, for example, get a uh, stroke, uh, they may, the lucky ones may get treated, but then uh, the rehabilitation is largely uh, unavailable to uh, a lot of them. And then most of them, actually, I read statistics that three fourths of them are left with. Uh, uh, dependence or disabilities that really shouldn't have been uh, left in the first place. And the third thing is that uh, as we look at the um, uh, equality of access to healthcare, I think most people ignore the fact that the people with less means in their childhood or in their um, adult life tend to have more severe health issues and need more help. but that's when exactly they are more disadvantaged to get uh, healthcare resources and services. And this is what uh, today we are seeing um, increasing inequality of access to healthcare. More and more uh, fancy healthcare facilities are being developed, uh, giving better healthcare to people who are uh, more advantaged, but the people who are left in uh, poorer access to healthcare face even bigger challenges. So I think the, the system, uh, the healthcare reform, needs to address these top issues as well. Jump in any time, guys, if you have anything to add. I mean, one of the things that's always struck me in, in running you know, my businesses in China is whenever one of my staff gets sick, they take the day off, they, they, they go at five o'clock in the morning to start lining up at a major hospital. At some point in the afternoon, they might be able to see uh, a doctor to be prescribed, uh, well, not even be prescribed with antibiotics, to have an intravenous drip um, that blasts the, 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 the common cold 
um, and then comes into work um, the next day. And this is what happens in major urban centres. How does China reform that system, not only in the big cities, but even in the, the lower tier cities and rural areas? This is a massive challenge, is it not? Josette, do you have a view on, on, on this from a... Well, you know, one thing that's really not that well known is the collaboration that's been going on between China's Center for Disease Control and the U.S. Center for Disease Control and the FDA's and the kind of healthcare establishment. And I think what is so, has so much potential in China is to learn from the mistakes of others and not just rebuild these systems that really are not fit for purpose and were fit for another era. One of those is certainly getting ahead of the challenge and investing in the wellness piece. And it's a little bit sad to see throughout traditional societies a loss and disconnect with kind of traditional diets and traditional ways of dealing with things that really were much healthier. And you see again this kind of pivot away from them. I think China, you know, you see it in food also that the scale of approaches and interventions in the United States or even Europe are really not fit for the solutions for China. And so I think um, Stephen's exactly right. I mean, we want to see a generation of entrepreneurs in China helping to create a new pathway to do that and looking at this. The other thing I'll say is I think you know, we're in a place in the world where we're moving to an idea that small is beautiful again. And not everything has to be massive in schools and in services. And so getting away from these massive solutions to much more mobile, agile solutions that can utilize technology and mobile technologies to solve these problems. China could convene the best minds in the world and try to map out what this looks like and become, I think, a pace setter. Any other comments on that? speak specifically about the hospital issue that you raised, and it, and it has broader, broader uh, implications. I mean, I think there are two factors specifically that need to be changed quickly, uh, or at least efforts to change. One is financial, uh, and the other is cultural. I mean, at the moment, the financial incentives in hospitals, uh, and to a lesser degree, but they're also present in community care, is that the more treatment and the longer the patient stays in hospital, the more it's intravenous rather than oral, the more the doctors at the hospital stand to earn. So you're never going to really change that pattern unless you change the way in which um, reimbursement is provided for healthcare services. That's critical. But I think there's also a major cultural issue. And you know, I think often we forget medicine is not just something that is given to people. There has to be cultural acceptance of what is right and what's helpful. And at the moment, largely because of the financial system, the culture in this country sees invasive, uh, intensive care, irrespective of whether it's justified or not, as being value, uh, value for the money they pay, uh, but also of health value. And that, and that just simply isn't the case. And we have to change that expectation. And we have to sort of, uh, I think, change medicine away from being, uh, you know, something that involves needles and um, antibiotics or something that is actually a positive thing, like education, that has to be made a positive thing, part of, part of, our, part of Chinese culture. But how does that, how does that work when, when the whole, when we talk about preventative medicine, right, when the whole system is based around fixing people when they're sick, right, how do drug companies make money, how do general practitioners make money off a preventative healthcare um, system? Because the more people who are sick, the less money that they're making. They won't be able to sell drugs, and drug development is expensive. How does that? How does that work? Uh, no, I was just going to say. I mean, this is why I was saying we really have to involve the finance ministers, the presidents, and prime ministers because it requires a bigger understanding of the investment in society and where you're putting the incentives. I was at a very interesting program in Japan where one out of every five children is pre-diabetes and you know, it's all really going in the wrong direction on uh, kind of health and non-communicative diseases. And they have in, in the school lunch programs, it's now become a course and children have to design the meal 
and they fail if they don't get the right balance of nutrients in the meal. And children are being educated in school because they've lost the knowledge of what it means to be healthy. But that required you know, leadership at a government level. And so I think it's important you know, to tackle that, and it does require leadership. It can't just be the private sector, even though there's money to be made in wellness, as we see. It's a huge industry. I think uh, we, uh, one word that Stephen mentioned earlier was entrepreneurship. I think uh, frugal innovations in developing countries from young people who just cannot sit there and wait for someone else to fix the problems could come up with a more creative uh, and uh, impactful uh, solutions. One example is uh, where we looked at um, how all the top healthcare resources are, uh, are uh, crowded in the tertiary hospitals in big cities, but in uh, fourth, fifth tier cities or remote villages, uh, the primary doctors, primary care uh, practitioners have very little access to uh, getting even a diagnosis right. So uh, using today using some um, telecare or, or very affordable technologies and uh, pieces of hardware, uh, they can get direct advice from all these uh, experts in big cities and then they, what they can do uh, better is to then follow up from, from there onwards and make sure that uh, all the advices are being um, enforced uh, later on. And this changes the way people think about, at least in China, think about uh, the tiered approach to healthcare. Normally, the primary care doctors are supposed to make the diagnosis, and then if they cannot solve the problems, they escalate to uh, higher levels. But uh, if they make all the meet all the errors in the first place, then it's harder to fix uh, later on when the patient's problems are escalated. So today we see already a lot of technologies being used to help reverse the order of uh, making the right diagnosis and uh, advice for people in areas where they uh, traditionally didn't have access to these. Uh, very good. We've got very limited time, but I, I did want to bring the audience in um, in this discussion. If there's any comments or, let's make it questions at this point. Please keep with the questions. No grandstanding, no sort of long soliloquies that go on for five minutes um, in the interest of time. If you have a question, if you have a question that you'd like to um, ask the audience, please raise your hand. We have a number of roaming, ro roaming microphones ar ar around. Um, is there anybody that would like to ask a question, or the sparker move the move the the discussion in a in a in a different direction? Just as over there. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? We, we just had problems here. The question was around child nutrition versus non-communicable uh, diseases. Would somebody want to have a crack at that? Uh, my name is Robert Scherby. I'm the Chief of Health and Nutrition in UNICEF China. Um, my question is, uh, what is the uh, uh, role of child nutrition in addressing I actually have uh, one comment there. In um, well, on the first of October, WHO just issued the first world report on uh, aging and health, and in it, some of the research actually pointed at how um, health in the uh, in the senior years among elderly is um, actually uh, affected starting from, uh, from childhood or even from uh, pregnancy. And uh, the, the idea that a uh, child um, who are malnourished uh, can develop more easily, develop the uh, non-communicable diseases like, um, um, like, uh, like stroke, for example, uh, is actually a, um, a huge challenge 
to countries when they want to, when they have the uh, willingness and means to address the issues later on, just like Josette mentioned earlier. So um, a lot of the uh, battles fighting against the NCDs should actually start much earlier on, uh, as far as we can see from the research statistics. And there's such a link with obesity with every NCD. And, you know, the people don't know that the malnourishment in Asia is much bigger than in Africa or elsewhere. I mean, UNICEF knows it well. It's really what you spend a lot of your time on, rightly so. I think the intervention, cost per intervention, it can, just cannot be denied that nailing the ch proper nutrition in childhood is something that's really non-negotiable for a country. It's the brain power of a country, it's the health base of a country, it's the right intervention, it's inexpensive, it's doable, especially if you use schools and other, you know, I think, convening places. So, I th you know, the one thing that um, is very worrisome is the malnutrition passed generation to generation and needing to really take care of pregnant and lactating women who really are the source of nutrition at the very young age. And that's, I think, a big gap in our understanding of the best ways to do that. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the floor? Please raise your hand and we'll give you, a, we'll give you one of our microphones. I know there was a, um, there was a specific forum on women's health um, uh, that was held just before this. And one of the things that was discussed was the impact of the um, the, the loosening of the, of the one or, or the abolition of the one child policy um, on, on health issues um, in, in China. I, I wonder if anyone from the panel has a comment on, on, on that. Well, as, as one of the Chinese women who are suddenly now offered the uh, opportunity to have a second child, uh, I, I do hear among my, my friends who, who are in their late 30s or, uh, or early 40s saying, um, now that I, I'm allowed to do it, can I still do it? And, uh, and they're worried about not being in the perfect shape to uh, give birth to a healthy second child. So I think that actually brings the question of uh, uh, a lot of health education and intervention to help these um, women in their maybe uh, late age of um, having, you know, of fertility to have still healthy pregnancy and uh, being able to balance uh, what they are doing uh, in their career and uh, also child bringing. Maybe if I could just make one comment there. Um, look, I think, it, I think it has potentially enormous positive consequences for health in this country. Um, I think one of the, the things about the current age structure is that the need for care for the elderly is going to be vast and the capacity of the country and the families to, to look after the older population is very limited. And by building a, a, a larger next generation, um, the capacity of families to look after their parents or their grandparents is going to be much greater. Um, I know that there is a sense that maybe this can all be solved by building uh, millions of beds in, uh, in aged care facilities. Uh, but that seems uh, highly implausible, uh, and I think we do have to look at solutions. Uh, and some of the work that, that we do, um, Zhang Bu Hong, who's here, has a wonderful study looking at how, how can children help their parents manage diabetes, and I think there has to be a lot more of that. Um, and to be per perfectly honest, the more kids around to do that, the better. It's interesting, I, I've just been delving into some of the literature on this after the announcement, and you know, there's quite a bit of assessment that China's birth rate was going to pretty much come down to under two per child at any rate during this time, and so both the benefits and the tragic consequences in some way of the policy that you know, really is deeply embedded in the mind of China, um, I think you raised the right question. Do you just turn on the fertility machine like that? <laughs> and so for women who, you know, are, I mean, the cost of living is very expensive. 
uh, people in a way get used to this and, and shift, and so the predictions of how much of an engine that will turn on, it really surprised me that it's not much. And so now government's realizing, you know, this isn't quite something you can kind of just flick a dial and all of a sudden everyone's having two children. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on, on that note, um, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, and so, look, just to, to thank the panel, um, to thank Josette um, for, 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 for everything, there's a whole bunch of thank yous, um, I think, on behalf of the George Institute that, that we, need to, we need to give um, to the Asia Society um, for supporting us and for making this, uh, this happen. Um, to the Australian Embassy again for all of your support and all of our partners and friends um, out there, including Auscham, Amcham and all the other partners that we've had um, over the years and, and specifically for this event. Um, and last but not least, to the George Institute staff that, who we all know have been working tirelessly um, for a long, long time. Um, Rich and his team in pulling all of this uh, together has been a team effort. So everyone, Thank you very much for joining us. We've only just touched on some of these issues, but we hope we've given you a flavour of you know, why we're all involved in this field. Um, I hope you've had a great time, and on behalf of the George Institute, thank you all for coming.